Daddy, help me. Daddy, where are you? Cheryl! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, I'm Josh Drive Hayes, and today we're going back to 1999 and replaying the classic PlayStation 1 survival horror, Silent Hill. You've probably heard of the Silent Hill franchise being a close rival to the Resident Evil games, and you've probably seen Silent Hill 2 pop up in a number of best horror games of all time lists. But how did the whole thing start? There's not much information out there on Silent Hill 1, so what were the origins? This is another game I never finished as a child, so join me as I finish the entire thing, praise the good, critique the bad, and then ask Silent Hill 1. Was it any good? Spoiler warning for pretty much everything, because I'll be finishing the entire game, going over all the major gameplay mechanics and moments, designs and story themes, and then at the end I'll explain the absolutely insane plot, because it does get somewhat convoluted. Before we dive into this demonic foggy town of Silent Hill, a big thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep the channel alive. More on how you can support at the end. For now, Let's begin. The game starts with an intro movie, which for 1999 actually looked pretty good. This short selection of pre-game cutscenes actually sets up all the major characters and the events. Basically, you're driving with your kid in the car because she wanted you to go and visit the town of Silent Hill. You spot someone on the road, swerve off and crash. You get out your car to follow your kid and then they are gone. This entire intro movie plays out over an ambient light rock soundtrack and the music is actually really good. Have a listen. Honestly, the intro is really high quality. While model quality and fidelity will increase over time, Silent Hill has paid attention to the cinematography and the camera angles, which is a timeless skill of filmmaking. It's a game made like a film. In fact, excellent use of camera angles is something we'll return to again and again, because Silent Hill really knows how to use the player's viewpoint to evoke an emotional response to a scene and to enhance the gameplay mechanics of each individual area. This is top quality stuff. You wake up from your car crash and your daughter Cheryl is missing, so we stumble around trying to find her. Tank controls, meaning forward and backward moves you forward and back, left and right turn you. Pressing triangle opens your map, which we'll return to in detail later, and holding L2 unlocks free look mode, which is honestly really nice. In most static camera angle horror games, the camera is placed and cannot be moved. In Silent Hill, provided you are in an open or explorable area, you can hold L2 to center the camera behind you and then swing it around. It brings a level of freedom to the open world and makes exploration a lot easier, while also allowing them to use static fixed angles in the more cinematic, tense moments. The game is essentially an exploration-based puzzler and a set-piece-based horror adventure combined, and they've designed it so when you are exploring, you can control your view. And when you're in a set piece, you see what they intended, and they've blended the two really smoothly. If they need you to see something important, they'll set the camera to show it or focus on it. If they want to encourage you to find something, they'll unlock the camera to allow you to find it. You've left your crash car to find your daughter. You run into the thick fog and freezing snow to find her. We'll talk about the fog more later. You run down an alley where you find a pile of gore on the ground. Nothing dangerous has happened yet, it's just there to unsettle you. And then you run down more creepy alley, which uses this gorgeous Dutch tilted camera angle to really unnerve you. And you find a lighter on the ground, which when you flick on, you get this localized glow of light, which barely helps you navigate but you come to rely on quite heavily. And the first thing you find is an overturned wheelchair, with the wheel still spinning. And this is something Silent Hill does exceptionally well, making the normal abnormal. And within only five minutes of playing, we've seen three of the major gameplay aspects. So let's expand on those. First off, the fog in the town. This is one of the best examples of limitation breeding creativity. I've always told people, if you have unlimited money and time and power to create, you'll often create something boring. It's only when faced with limitations or lack of resources, you're forced to find unique or novel solutions to things, and this is one of them. They wanted the town of Silent Hill to be all loaded in at once and all rendered with really long sight lines, but the PlayStation 1 simply wasn't powerful enough to do that. They couldn't get the draw distances they wanted with the quality of textures they had. 
So instead of making the town smaller or the textures worse, they embraced the low draw distance and made it a feature. They made it into fog. The PlayStation 1 only had one meg of memory shared between video and audio, and as they needed high quality audio, they just reduced the load distance of anything in an open area, resulting in the now iconic fog effect. Other PlayStation 1 games at the time did have longer draw distances, but they achieved this with reduced texture quality, lower polygon count, or lower audio quality. Silent Hill wanted everything you see to be as high quality as possible for the time. Complex textures and dynamic lighting effects on everything weather effects like rain and snow overlaying at the same time, so shorter draw distances were needed in open areas. Then we've got the gore and the wheelchair, both examples of visual storytelling, the art of showing the player all the elements of a story, the results of a series of events, and then allowing the player to piece together the events themselves in their own head. While there is a story to the events of Silent Hill, they're never explicitly explained. In fact, there's an entire subplot you can completely miss if you don't explore the whole town. Silent Hill is a town after the fact, after the event. You're seeing the aftermath of something awful. And how much effort you put into finding the plot is up to you. Your main goal the entire time is find your daughter Cheryl. Everything else, understanding the fate of the town, is given to you through background images and item placement. Like, why is there a hospital bed out in an alleyway? Is there a hospital involved? Will we visit it later in the game? All of the questions you'll be asking yourself, and the answer to all of them is yes. Sometimes the visual storytelling is subtle, like a room messed up showing or implying a search, and sometimes it's a bit more overt, like a flayed body strung up on barbed wire. This is a sight you'll see very early in the game, and it sets the tone for the rest, and the fact that it's so simple makes it even more horrifying. Gore is one of the easiest horror tropes to do. You just show blood and pain and screaming and you try to horrify people by making them watch suffering. It's the basis of the Saw films. But this isn't active, painful gore. This is just the very simple aftermath. The body has been flayed, then hung up. There's no dripping blood, just dried crusts. No screams of pain, just silence. No struggle, just the result. And Silent Hill 1 wants you to know this is the situation you're walking into. You're not going to save these people. You're not going to run in at the 11th hour and be heralded as a hero. You're not going to stop this. It's already happened. If you want your daughter back, you're going to have to go through the town. You won't save it. You won't fix it. You just have to survive it. You can't win here. You can only escape. After finding the flayed body, you're going to meet the first enemies, some shambling corpses, and the only way out is to run into more darkness, the local glow of your lighter barely illuminating the pitch black as you sprint into a dead end. You're trapped. There's no way out. No hope. You are going to meet the same fate as the flayed man, and you die. Thankfully, that's a scripted death, and you wake up in a restaurant, and now the great atmosphere built up through the use of multiple visual, audio, and storytelling techniques is all undone as we are forced to listen to the voice acting. From excellence in cinematography to the absolute failure of the voice acting, Silent Hill 1 is voiced, and at first I was convinced they'd got the local community college to just try their best, but then I researched and no, they've got the main character, Harry Mason, voiced by Michael Gwynn, the same dude who did Count Dracula in Symphony of the Night. And he was fantastic in that. He did the whole what is a man, a miserable little pile of secrets line. And yet in this, he's terrible. In fact, everyone in this is terrible. Just listen, this is meant to be a natural conversation between a man who's just been in a car crash and is now in a deserted town and a policewoman. Was I dreaming? How do you feel? Oh. I've been run over by a truck, but I'm all right, I guess. Glad to hear it. You from around here? Why don't you tell me what happened? Wait a second, I'm just a tourist. I came here for a vacation. I just got here. I don't know what happened. like to find out myself. That was truly terrible and carried no emotion or weight at all. You'd have been better off just not having voices. So we've met Sybil, the policewoman. She's given us a gun and now we explore the diner and pick up various items. You actually can't leave until you've gathered all the essentials. A health restoring drink, a map, which will be absolutely essential, 
a flashlight you will never ever turn off, and a save point. You can only save your game at these red notepads. Thankfully, there's no limit on how many times you can save. Take that, Resident Evil typewriters. We also find a knife. You can equip weapons through the menu, then hold R2 to aim and press X to attack. With a melee weapon, this means you pathetically swipe at whatever's directly in front of you. Seriously, the knife is useless. We try to leave, and then this radio buzzes with static. And then a flying monster bursts through the glass window. Ah, our first fight. So I use the knife I just got, and I die. You can take three or four hits before dying, and your health is shown in the menu screen by the colour of the portrait in the top left. A green pulse behind your face is good, orange is bad, and red is almost dead. So I reload my game, and this time I use the gun, and that's much more effective. We then pick up the radio, and we're given one of the greatest mechanics in the game. When an enemy is near, you will hear the radio static start to hum, and as they get closer, the static gets louder. This means if it's silent, you are safe, and the game completely respects this mechanic, allowing you to safely rely on it as an early warning system for enemies. It completely respects it until about 90% of the way in, when the radio stops working, and you'll hear static when there's nothing, and nothing when there is something. It builds up your reliance on a mechanic, and then takes it away later, which actually perfectly fits the theme of growing insanity, and the game does a lot. We'll take a look at this more in detail later on. With the radio found, we check the map, and here is a feature I absolutely love and should be in every horror game forever. Your map gets marked as you gain more information. You need to go to the alley, so there's a red arrow drawn pointing you into the alley. As you explore the town and discover roads are destroyed, your map will be marked with a large red X showing you can't go this way. As you explore buildings, you'll mark your map with which doors are locked and which doors are open and which rooms have important things in them. The fact your map is updated in real time with information you as a player gain is absolutely fantastic. Silent Hill wants to scare you, but it also wants to know it respects your effort and your time. It doesn't hide the information you've gathered as a cheap scare tactic. It's happy to show you everything you've worked for so far. And this guidance system means you're never unsure of where to go. You're effectively being given an in-game, in-character guide to the next major location, and this keeps the game moving. It keeps the player exploring at the pace the designers intended, and while it won't solve the puzzles for you, it will tell you which areas you need to be in to solve them. One of the worst experiences a player can have in the middle of a horror game is the feeling of, where do I go? Those moments of being lost and directionless can kill tension. They replace your fear of the situation with annoyance. Silent Hill has taken steps to make sure that doesn't happen. Running through the town and we're attacked by one of many, many enemies, the rabid dogs. A few bullets put them down and then I discover once an enemy is downed, it's not fully dead. You need to walk over and stamp on it. This applies to almost all the enemies. It means getting up close and personal with something that was trying to kill you. Returning to the alley from the opening and we find Cheryl's sketchbook on the floor with to school written in it. There's also a note with Doghouse Levin Street, which means nothing to me yet. So we're off to the school. Oh, quick note about the gun, you need to reload. You can either go into the menu and do it manually, or just release R2 and then hold it again. Does the same thing. Thankfully, the enemies have aggro ranges and they won't actually follow you that far, meaning in big open spaces, running away is always the best choice. Save your ammo for when you're trapped in a corridor somewhere and you need to shoot your way out. Taking the fastest route to the school via the map will lead to this destroyed road. There's no way across and your map is updated with a big X. In fact, taking any route to the school via any main roads leads to a destroyed road, and this highlights one annoyance with the game. You'll be opening and closing your map a lot, both outside in the various town sections and inside in buildings. Going to and from the map is a constant gameplay loop, and because the PlayStation 1 needs to take a moment to load it, that's a lot of time spent looking at a black loading screen. Silent Hill 1 has fantastic ambience, great sound, great camera angles, and great puzzles, but navigation becomes a really, really time-consuming loop of open the map, go to the game, open the map, go to the game, open the map, go to the game and you will spend about half of your gameplay time looking at the map. But while you're in the game, it looks and sounds great. So let's talk about the sound. Silent Hill is a game about gradually descending into madness. You start in a relatively stable state, understandable place with understandable goals, and as you stay longer in the nightmare and go through hell, you eventually fall into a great chasm of darkness, and the sound design reflects this throughout the game. When you first discover the dead flayed body, there is nothing. No loud musical sting, no scream, no horror tones, it's just there. 
because there wouldn't be music. It's very diegetic. And as you explore the city, you'll get these deep, low tones. They're unsettling, but they're not completely unnatural. You've got the howling wind of an empty town. And then inside the school, you've got the clanking of water pipes or the rhythmic pulsing of electrical discharge next to the generator. And only when you get deeper into the game and into madness do you start to hear distant laughter or crying, birds fluttering when there are none, gunshots in empty buildings or chanting coming from nowhere. While you as a player and a character are sane, the game is sane. And as you experience more, your senses experience more. You become overwhelmed and your senses begin to lie to you. You see ghosts, you hear scratching, but it's not done to scare you with empty, pointless effects. It's done as a reflection of your state of mind and it also happens to be scary. The game designers didn't say, hey, let's add some children's laughter because it'll be scary. They said, at what point will you have gone mad enough and at what location should you start hearing children's laughter? What you hear in the game is what you legitimately believe would be there, because Silent Hill 1 is very much a game about belief, and this makes it scarier. You don't think, oh, that was scary, but it's gone now. You think, is that real? Am I imagining it? Am I hearing that? Does that make sense? You, as a player, begin to question yourself as much as Harry Mason as a character. All the roads leading to the school are blocked, so we've only got the note to go on. Doghouse, Levin Street. So I go and check it out, and in the doghouse there is a key to a house, which we can assume is this house. So we go in and, okay, now we are safe. No radio static. Grab some supplies we find lying around, and the back door to the house, which would lead us to the school road, is locked with three locks. And there's a map on the wall with three key locations marked in blood. Looking at this map copies the information to our map, so I assume we have to find them, so off we go. Silent Hill does this a lot. You'll find a door, see it's locked, then you need multiple things to unlock it. Keys, objects, finishing puzzles, turning off generators, blocking up drains. It's essentially a giant puzzle game set in a scary town. At the start of the game, your map is a great help, basically saying, go here exactly. As you progress, your map becomes more of a general area. The solution is probably around here. And at the end, when you lose your map, all oh, things get complicated. We'll get to that later. We find the lion key in the boot of a crashed police car as it attempts to escape the breaking road. And then we get more visual storytelling over here. A severed dog head underneath a basketball hoop with a blood splat on the backboard. You don't need to see the event happening to know what happened. And that makes it worse. This game loves showing you the subtle aftermath of a disturbing event. The third key is across the bridge, and this highlights another major element of the early game, a lot of running. You'll spend a good half of the game running back and forth. In the later sections, the gameplay is very densely packed, with lots of close rooms and puzzles and objects and enemies, but the opening is mostly just running back and forth. The three keys we need are the key of Lion, key of Scarecrow, and key of Woodman, which you may recognise as references to the Wizard of Oz. And this is another major theme of Silent Hill, allusions to classic literature are all focusing on the theme of another world, or a character slowly approaching madness. Later we'll have references to Alice in Wonderland with certain item names. You'll see Hemingway brand cigarettes. If you read the newspapers, you'll see mentions of Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. The whole world is constantly referencing works focused on madness. When you unlock the door with the three keys and head into the back garden, the game gets even darker. An unnatural, all-encompassing black surrounds us, and now you're relying even more on your flashlight. Thankfully, it doesn't take batteries and doesn't run out. We reach the school and grab the most important of items in the opening room, the map. Whenever you change area, your priority is always to find the map of that area because navigation is more frustrating than any enemy or puzzle. Here is the most unrealistic part of the game. A school nurse's office actually stocked with medicine and not just off-brand plasters. The school itself is creepy because, again, it's taken the normal and made it abnormal. So let's just dive into this much more, because it's one of the best ways to do horror. Seeing something horrific, like a mutilated body or cosmic horror, can be scary, but there's also enough of a disconnect between it and your actual everyday experience that you never truly immerse yourself in the horrific situation. Because you think, yeah, it's scary, but it's not going to happen to me. Silent Hill goes for a different approach. Instead of showing you something completely supernatural, it takes something natural, what you already know, what you've likely experienced, and presents it in a wrong, twisted way. Like a hospital bed in an alleyway. 
You've probably seen a hospital bed and an alleyway, but not together. And it's the presentation of the normal in an abnormal way which makes the horror hit much closer to home. The old horror movie trope is the abandoned mental asylum. And as scary as that sounds, most of us haven't actually been in an abandoned mental asylum. So that disconnect between personal experience and in-game experience is strong enough to keep the moment of true immersion at bay. You don't have a memory to connect what you as a player feel to what your avatar in-game is feeling. But in Silent Hill, you're in a school, a standard normal primary school. We probably all know these types of hallways, of classrooms with desks lined up in neat rows. We are used to them being busy, packed with people. We have memories of places exactly like this one. To see something we know, a school, presented in a way we don't know, completely empty, is close enough to home to be truly unnerving. It's not fantastical, unrealistic horror. It's grounded, believable horror. Combine this understandable, relatable situation with a deeply uncomfortable, low droning sound, and you get this kind of ambience. Honestly, the whole school section is deeply uncomfortable, which is fantastic. The school itself is one massive puzzle. You'll find some occult notes on the reception desk with references to rooms and times, and you need to explore everywhere to find the correct combination of items and rooms. There's also a courtyard with some shambling zombies, but they don't follow you from map to map or room to room, so they're not worth the ammo to kill. Some of the creepiest moments aren't enemies, but flashes of things you think you see or hear like ghost babies running around and then fading into nothingness. They're not dangerous, just unexpected. Or when you run into the toilets and you hear sobbing from one of the cubicles, but there's no one there. The school itself is huge, and after enough exploring, you'll find this locker room and a single locker with something banging from inside. So you go to open it and... Now that is audio storytelling. We hear the cat run, screech, and then a horrific mutilating slice and crunch of flesh and bone. We don't need to see what happened to know what happened. Another example of Silent Hill forcing you to imagine something and using your imagination makes it worse than anything they could show you. Also, remember this locker room and cat? It'll matter later. Explore the entire school, including the basement. Nice touch here, there's a valve, but we can't turn it because our character doesn't know what it does. I like this. In most games, you can just randomly press buttons or turn valves. In Silent Hill, you don't mess with stuff unless you have a reason to, so all of your actions logically link to the next, which is a lovely narrative-driven set of decisions. Like how we find some acid in the chemical lab, then a cryptic note saying, Sage's water will release the amulet. Then we find a stone hand holding an amulet, so we pour the acid on the stone hand and we get the amulet. Then we use the amulet on a clock tower which changes it to two o'clock. And then we find a note saying at two o'clock we need to go to the room of songs and sound, which is likely the music room. So in the music room there's a piano and a puzzle about birds. Everything flows. Now I'm not going to spoil all the puzzles for anyone who's going to play this, because I highly recommend you do, 
Just know that some of them are cryptic as hell. They're never unfair. You can't necessarily miss a piece. You're given all the information you need, but god damn do they take some figuring out. This is the right combination of musical notes related to the descriptions of birds, and I was here for quite a while before I finally got it. This puzzle gets me the second medallion, which we put into the clock tower again, which opens the door, and we climb in and then a very strange series of events. The clock tower goes up, so I was expecting to climb up into the structure, but no. You climb down, underground. Then we walk through a tunnel, and then back up. And we emerge from the same clock tower, but now we're inside a horrific, twisted version of the school. And here we take our first steps into the nightmare world. The solid floor has been replaced with metal grating suspended above an endless black void. The painted walls of the corridor are now rusted metal plates. There are chains hanging from the rafters, the school desks are bent and broken, and the enemies are much, much stronger. Exploring the nightmare world isn't fun, and eventually we run into this gruesome doorway flanked by two bodies wrapped in cloth strung up either side. And we've seen this before, on a painting in the real school. So we use a picture card we picked up earlier to open and probe deeper into this hellish vision. While in the nightmare vision, even navigation is used against us. Entering the girls' bathroom on the first floor actually sends you to the girls' bathroom on the second floor, so when you leave, you'll be in a different corridor. And until you realise this is what's happening, it's really disturbing. The one thing you've been able to rely on so far, the strongest measure of your connection to reality, is knowing where you are at all times. The nightmare world subtly takes that away, and it takes it away early, while here you cannot trust anything you see. Remember I said the horror is understated, and the lack of sound cues telling you when to jump or when to be scared means you're just allowed to remain scared at your own pace? Here's a great example. In order to find the shotgun, you need to walk into this very small room with another body strung up. When a film has a loud noise or a jump scare, it's a moment of tension and release. The horror is shown and then removed. Dramatic tension is spent. In Silent Hill 1, there's no tension release. No noise, no moment of, it's gone now. It's always there. You just need to walk away knowing it's still there. Another example of the known being shown in an unknowable way. The deep reds and blacks of the bloody, rusted, hellish school contrast with the bright blue phones on the table. They're completely out of place. You understand both of them separately, but together they confuse. And then, one of the phones rings. Daddy? Help me! Daddy? Where are you? Cheryl! The game constantly reminds you of your main goal, find your daughter. And now it's taken away navigation being stable, that's actually all you have to cling to. Everything you do, you are doing for your daughter. So we continue through the school, and up on the roof you can marvel at this artwork of barbed wire and bodies. You can wash a key from the roof down a drain and head down to the courtyard to pick it up, and hey, it's the locker room from earlier, but it's the nightmare version, and... I wonder. What a fantastic fake-out. The jump scare works by building up tension and then releasing it, but if you can see it coming, it's not scary. So they build up something expected based on knowledge you already have, and then they do nothing, relaxing you into safety. You let your guard down, thinking the moment has passed, and then they get you with another locker, a perfectly manipulated set piece. Later in the library, we find a fairy tale about a brave archer killing an evil lizard. The story tells about how the archer waited for the lizard to open its mouth and then fired a flaming arrow into it. Now remember this, because it will be useful shortly. 
because we will find the lizard boss in the basement and we need to wait for it to open its mouth and then unload the shotgun into it. So let's just talk about the bosses. Silent Hill 1 isn't a combat focused game. You can run from most of the fights and solve most puzzles in relative safety, but the boss fights require combat and honestly I think they are the weakest part of the game because they go against the general vibe of the game. It's never about showing explicit horror, it's been about implying and hinting, leading the player to think the worst thoughts. And the bosses, well, they take the game from psychological horror into action. And you beat every single boss the same way. Equip your best gun, walk backwards, keep firing. When you get hit, open your inventory and use a health potion. I even did the entire optional secondary story to get the good ending and will show you the secret boss at the end, and it's literally just tank damage and shoot it a lot. The boss fights are the game forcing you to do combat, when it's made combat such a personal choice up until now. Taken at face value, it's not a bad section, it just feels out of place compared to the rest of the game. Kill the lizard and we get phased back into the real school, catching a vision of a young girl before she runs away. Also we find a key belonging to Kay Gordon. And in a series of logical steps I really like, if you check the register at reception you'll find Kay Gordon is a teacher and you'll mark his home address on your map. When you leave the school you'll hear church bells ringing and you decide to head to the church because it means somebody is there, but again all the roads are blocked and all you have to go on is Kay Gordon's key so you can go through his house. Look at this camera angle. Wine in the foreground, character mid, background of the house, this whole game has been storyboarded like a film. The game Silent Hill is actually a better Silent Hill film than the Silent Hill film. Make our way to the church and now we meet the crazy preacher lady who also seems to be the only voice actor putting any effort into getting into character. Were you ringing that bell? I've been expecting you. It was foretold by gyromancy. What are you talking about? I knew you'd come. You want the girl, right? The girl? You're talking about Cheryl. That was Dahlia. She tells us to go to the hospital and gives us this strange object called a flowross, and this is the moment the plot starts getting weird. I mean, it's been pretty occult and eclectic up until now, but it was always grounded. From here on out, the grounding falls away. The hospital is another long runaway which sends us through the shopping district, and oh good, now the zombies can jump. They're still not worth killing because shooting takes too long and there are too many of them. So I scour the police station for ammunition and unfortunately no sign of Sybil, and then I run into the hospital. In the hospital, we hear a single gunshot, and then we meet another alive human. Hold it! <gasps> Stop! Don't shoot! Wait! I'm not here to fight. My name is Harry Mason. I'm in town on vacation. Thank God. Another human being. Do you work here? I'm Dr. Michael Kaufman. I work at this hospital. Do you see what I mean when I say the voice acting seems way too calm given the current situation? Okay, new location, which means new map. I don't care about bullets or health packs, I want a map. Silent Hill makes you rely on maps, and those brief few moments in a new zone without a map make you feel like a lost baby. Now, Silent Hill 1 has several endings. The bad ending, the okay ending, and the good ending. And to get the good ending, you need to do a lot of random, seemingly pointless steps, which only make sense in hindsight. But to get the final real boss, you need to get the good ending so I'll be making sure to do all those extra steps. Like heading into the hospital kitchen and picking up a random empty plastic bottle and then filling it with a strange red liquid from the floor because I'll need it later. Normally I would dislike a game for having such random unknowable steps, but Silent Hill 1 is actually designed to be completed repeatedly and every completion you learn what you need to do earlier in your next attempt. So it's actually designed to work like this. Here's a lovely subtle bit of psychological terror. When you're in the elevator, you can activate the panel and go to floor 1, 2 or 3. You can only go to each one, but they're all locked. But once you've been to the third floor, the panel now gives a new button. Floor 4. There's no attention drawn to it, 
It's just there. It's not on the map, it's not spoken about, it's just there. And heading to the fourth floor triggers a cutscene of a young girl walking into an antique shop and then you're back in the nightmare world. Now we meet one of the most iconic enemies in the whole Silent Hill franchise, the nurse. These things take six shots to take down, meaning we are going to burn through ammo if we try and fight. Even more creepy experiences in the toilets. We hear banging, but there's no one there. Interestingly, when we kill a nurse, we can see some kind of parasite on their back, meaning they might not be possessed by a demonic spirit, but an actual physical thing. And this will be relevant later. We find a lighter and then some tentacles coming out of the wall, lapping at a puddle of blood. We distract them by throwing a blood pouch I found earlier. I do like how most puzzles are solved without combat. Slowly but surely, we are losing floor grates. Up until now, we've always had a stable foundation to walk on, but now that's being removed. As you stay in the nightmare world longer, more and more of what you come to rely on as consistent becomes inconsistent. But at least the shotgun works well. I mean, it's only effective at close range, but when you are close, it is very, very effective. Find a basement key, and of course this means we are heading to the basement, which is fine because the basement bestows upon me the hammer, the best melee weapon in the game. I know some of you will be commenting, it's the chainsaw or the rock drill. No, you're wrong, it's the hammer. Because this thing never runs out of ammo and has crazy good range. Look, there are three nurses in the corridor, and thanks to the glory of the hammer, they all go down without a struggle. All praise the almighty hammer. And this is possibly a good time to talk about the slow change of Silent Hill from horror survival to action survival and how it's not always a good thing. The opening of the game has you running away from weak enemies because you are also weak. And now I'm actively seeking out enemies and mashing them to a pulp, combined with the lizard boss needing to be shotguns to death and you'll see a slow switch in gameplay focus. The start of the game is survival horror, the ending is action puzzler with horror elements. Once you've got enough ammunition to take down a small army, you're not really afraid of anything anymore. Every enemy in the game is weak to the hammer or to enough bullets. Once you are armed, there is nothing more powerful than you. And this switch in your favour really lessens the impact of horror. I found myself eagerly running around corners ready to blast stuff with buckshot instead of creeping around slowly hoping to avoid death. I became the hunter. And when this happens, the game really loses what horror grip it had on you. Return to a locked room from earlier and we meet another sane human in the nightmare world, the nurse Lisa Garland. Finally, someone else who's okay. Who are you? My name's Lisa Garland. What's yours? Harry Mason. Harry, tell me what's happening here. Where is everybody? I must have gotten knocked out. When I came to, everyone was gone. It's awful. So you don't know anything either. After a chat with Lisa, we experience an extreme headache and wake up to see Dahlia, the crazy lady from the church. She gives us a key to an antique shop, the one from our vision earlier. To find the street address, you actually need to go into your menu and look at the key, which will mark the shop on your map. I like this, it's logical. So we run through the town and inside the antique shop, we meet police officer Sybil again. Harry! Sybil? Ah, oh, I'm glad you're okay. I shouldn't have left you. Things are worse than I thought. She said something about the town being devoured by darkness. Gibberish like that. Any idea what it means? Darkness devouring the town? Must be on drugs. Notice the line, they're all on drugs? Well, that's a massive bit of foreshadowing because, plot spoilers, most of the town actually is on drugs. That's one of the causes of the mass psychosis. There are demonic forces, but there are also a lot of drugs. In the antique shop, we find a secret back room with an occult altar. We examine it, fall unconscious again, and wake back up in the hospital talking to Lisa. Meaning, wait, did we even go to the antique shop? Lisa says she thinks she saw Cheryl our daughter, running to the town's resort sector. 
But before she can give us specifics for how to get there, we fall unconscious again and wake back up in the antique shop, except this time it's the nightmare version. This whole segment is very fast, and it's also the first time you feel reality breaking, making you as a player feel disconnected. So far, we've had the floor fall away, we've had the map be broken, but now we've had our connection to the world as a consistent entity shaken up. We've been teleported from location to location, we've had conversations that might not have happened, and we've been pulled from reality into the nightmare with no explanation. So from this moment on, you don't know what you can trust as real, even in the seemingly real real world. Leaving the antique shop puts you in the nightmare version of Silent Hill itself, and it's just as horrific as the school. Now this narrative break is a real double-edged sword as far as story consistency goes. On one side, yes, it's unsettling to not be sure what's real and what isn't. It's not a nice feeling to not be able to trust your own senses. But on the other hand, this really damages the central narrative thread we as players had been clinging to. Without a consistent world, our journey isn't following any form of internal logic logic anymore. It's now become creepy set piece moving to creepy set piece. If I don't have any control over my location, or those locations can be switched at will, my understanding of the game world layout might be damaged so much that I actually stop caring about it. Why would I put effort into learning a world if that world can be changed on a whim and I have no power over it? This is a real narrative risk. You're pulling all sense of consistency away from the player, and some players will embrace this as gamified insanity, following the themes of madness and the unreliable narrator, while some will be turned away by the lack of mechanical cohesion in a world they're trying to immerse themselves in. We need to find Lisa and ask about the resort and where she may have seen Cheryl. This means running through the shopping district, another location we all know, presented with the unusual, unsettling way of being completely empty. This also gives us this excellent creepy moment of all these TVs in a shop display turning on at once and playing static, then flashing up an occult symbol. A brilliant building of tension inside a relatable place, which is once again interrupted by a lackluster boss fight. This walkway falls down into a room full of sand and we get attacked by a giant slug. The giant slug swims through the sand and pops up to bite us and we defeat it by shooting at it enough. Once it's dead, it's not actually dead, it just burrows away and leaves, so we'll probably see it later. Head out the main doors and back to the main town of Silent Hill, it's moved even more toward madness. The buildings have been replaced with endless black and wind turbines, some rusted shut and some moving, and the road we were on replaced with grating built on stilts. This is otherworldly. This isn't where we were. This is another step toward the madness of constant, unknowable, unstoppable change, which itself reflects one of the themes the game is about to explore much more overtly, the process of growth and change. Sprint through the lashing rain to the hospital and find Lisa again. She explains we can go to the resort part of town by going through an underground tunnel connected to the waterworks. So we leave the hospital and again the world has changed and the previous open town is replaced by a single grated path leading to some steps. We run up to the roof and hey the slug boss from earlier is back but it's grown into a moth. Now the boss fight itself is nothing special, just back away and keep shooting. But it's what this whole sequence sequence represents which helps you understand the themes of Silent Hill. We beat the slug earlier, but it returned changed and stronger. So even victory isn't absolute. Then we left the hospital and the world changed. Our freedom of choice was replaced with a single inevitable journey and destination. This game is about loss and rebirth, about personal freedoms being forcibly replaced with a preset path. And that actually reflects the path our daughter Cheryl is taking now without our knowledge. And a lot of the design from this point forward will echo these story beats. Killing the moth sends us back to reality, at least we think it does, and heading back down the steps of the building actually now teleports you straight to the waterworks. I guess the game realised endless running wasn't engaging gameplay. Break the lock on the gate by smacking it with the hammer, first and only time we have to interact with the world via combat, and this gets us into the sewers and brings us another enemy, this green scratcher enemy. And these are super irritating because they hang from the ceiling, and the standard camera angle makes them impossible to to see. But first things first, grab the map on the wall. 
always remember the map. To avoid being ambushed from above, in the sewers you'll constantly be spinning the camera or readying your gun and watching to see if your character auto aims at something, and if they do, just shoot. The sewers are meant to be more of a cautious area, but because you've got a small army's worth of ammunition by now, it's also more of an action section than a horror section. This is a shooting gallery. Move, shoot, move, shoot. And as far as horror goes, this is one of the weakest sections. The strength of Silent Hill is it takes locations we know, like schools or hospitals, and fills them with enemies we can recognise, like undead children or corrupted nurses. And it focuses on puzzles and exploration while there, and in doing so it creates a sense of relatable horror. And now it's taken a place not many people know, a sewer, and fills it with enemies we can't relate to, green slicer things, and focuses on gunplay. And this actually creates a sense of relative comfort because we can definitely win with enough ammunition. The sewer section is the antithesis of Silent Hill's core design. Up until now, it's been things you recognise presented in ways you don't, filled with things more powerful than you. But here, it's a place you don't recognise, and you can't relate to, and you don't feel vulnerable because I'm the strongest thing here. This section loses all sense of dread or fear. Even when I'm ambushed by three enemies, which happened at the start of the game and was terrifying, now I can just outrun them and outgun them. This was a weak horror section. Out of the sewer we head to Annie's, a local diner, and we meet Kaufman again. He's in a spot of bother with a zombie, so we save him. Without as much as a thank you, he just leaves. But he drops his key and a receipt on his way out, so we pick it up. Now, all of this section is optional, but we need to do it for the good ending. So we head to the local shop of the receipt, search a drawer, open a safe behind the counter, and you find it's full of drugs, proving Kaufman was probably involved in the drug supply chain. We head to the motel shown on the receipt and get in using the code. Inside there's a poster on a wall of an attractive lady, but interacting with it says, don't look at this now. Harry has his priorities sorted. This is no time for ogling scantily clad women. The key Kaufman dropped earlier is for room three of the motel, so we go to room three and the shower curtain is across. So I check and oh, I'm really glad the game actually gives you the option to check the shower and lets you know no one is inside because I bet everyone checked. Find a bike key hidden in a hole in the floor, use it to start a bike in the motel's garage, and inside we find a vial of red liquid. Then Kaufman shows up and snatches the bottle from us. This is good. We needed this to happen to get the good ending. With all this sorted, we run across the bridge outside town toward the resort area, and then we shift to the nightmare world while completely awake. No headache, no unconscious moment, just a reality shift showing how the darkness is growing stronger. So we run through the nightmare pier and onto a boat, and we bump into Sybil again. Sybil. Harry. How did you get back here? I followed the sewer. Were you the one who cut the fence? Yeah. I'm glad you made it. I was worried about you. This whole thing's been a major blow to you. You need to rest. Sybil, I... The demon is awakening, spreading those wings. The plot by now is really starting to feel stretched. I'm guessing the designer had some cool ideas for locations, made them, then had to work out how to connect them. So we're told we need to go and check out the lighthouse because Cheryl may be there and Sybil will go and search the old amusement park, because Cheryl may be there. Well, it's really easy to get ambushed on these narrow pier walkways, so I just sprint past everything to the lighthouse. Now, the plot may have taken a strange turn, but the cinematography remains fantastic. This raising camera angle as we ascend the spiral staircase is gorgeous. On the roof, we have another vision of a girl fading into darkness, and the floor is covered with a huge glowing arcane sigil. There's nothing else here, so we run back to the boat, and Sybil isn't there, meaning we have to go to the amusement park and find her. That means another sewer section, and another new enemy, this fella with a mouth for a head. The creepiest thing about this part is how the ambient music reflects the new enemy design, and it sounds like someone's sucking in air through gritted teeth. It just really sets me on edge because it's knowable, but also strange. It's the best part of the sewer section. Have a listen.
This sewer section is otherwise as dull as the first because I've got a metric ton of ammunition, but when we reach the end it gets creepy again because there are merry-go-round horses floating in the water. Brilliant! Something we know, presented in a way we shouldn't know it. Back to psychological horror we go. God, I've never been happier to be creeped out. Welcome to the creepy amusement park, the fallback location of every low-budget horror film or middle-season Scooby-Doo episode. It's actually a shame they didn't use creepy carnival music because it would have fit really well here. And now on to another boss, but this time, well. Seems that Sybil has been infected with whatever got the nurses earlier, and she is the fight. Now this is extremely well done. You want to run away because she has a gun, but as you run, the carousel turns on, and Sybil is riding the horses towards us. That's such a nice use of physical scenery. Having your boss interact with the location it's in in a location-specific way is lovely to see. Now, you can just shoot Sybil and kill her, but the good ending needs her alive, so shoot her until she drops her gun, and then when she grabs you, use the red liquid you collected earlier. You'll pour it over her and save her. It seems that Sybil was infected with some kind of slug baby hybrid parasite, so the happenings in the town aren't completely supernatural. There's a form of creature horror here too. But now we get another cutscene with quite the revelation about Harry and Harry's daughter. It seems that Cheryl isn't our biological daughter. We found her on the side of a road and just adopted her several years ago. But then the young girl we've been seeing visions of shows up and pushes us back with a crazy psychic power. But then the Floros, the item we were given earlier, activates and pierces the girl with a beam of light, knocking her out. And then crazy church lady Dahlia shows up and it turns out the girl we've been seeing visions of is Alessa, Dahlia's daughter. Dahlia has been searching for her and we've unknowingly helped her by bringing the Floros to her, and then they both teleport away. And then we wake back up in the hospital from earlier again. Look, I'm going to explain the entire plot at the end, but for now, just go with it being a bit crazy and disjointed, because it does make sense eventually. Have a chat to Lisa and she explains that she looked in the basement despite her manager telling her not to and she found some creepy rooms and she has memories of being there but can't remember why. So we go and explore the nightmare basement some more. And now we begin the final section and we have to do it with the only mechanic we've been able to trust removed. We must solve the giant 3D maze of the final hospital section without a map. So this final section is a horrific amalgamation of important rooms from our memory all linked via a hospital corridor. There are hospital rooms, but there's also a room which looks like the antique shop, and then there's a classroom with a single desk in the centre, and we spend some time exploring and finding occult keys to open some occult doors, and then we meet Lisa for a final time. Harry? Lisa, what's the matter with you? I get it now. Why I'm still alive, even though everyone else is dead. I'm not the only one who's still walking around. I'm the same as them. I just hadn't noticed it before. Lisa. Stay by me, Harry. Please. I'm so scared. Help me. Save me from them. Please. Harry?
Lisa's convinced she's one of the insane nurses and actually, ironically, goes insane from this thought. But if you go back into the room, she's gone. And you can read her diary, where she talks about caring for a strange, burned girl and how she wishes the girl would die. More puzzles. In fact, one of the hardest puzzles in the game, the Zodiac symbol puzzle. You need to use the pictures around the room to decode the final images and find the numbers. I won't spoil it for you, but it is irritatingly hard. Down in the Otherworld kitchen, we find the only place in the game that you will instantly die if you make a mistake. Honestly, I'm not a fan of instant death mechanics because they're not scary, they're just frustrating. They're trial and error. A scary mechanic gives you a chance to escape it if you do it correctly. It keeps you on that knife edge of failure and success. The fear is in attempting to do it right. This is just, if you're wrong, you die straight away. You pull a knife out of a fridge, and if you walk away without doing anything else, the fridge opens up and drags you in. Game over. What you need to do is pull the knife out, and then use a ring that you picked up earlier to fix the broken chain to keep the monster in the fridge. Trial and error in a horror game does not hold tension well. This next bit is just laugh out loud surreal. You find a packet of jelly beans, violently rip them open, and a demonic key falls out. I think this is the moment that the logical puzzle solving starts to kind of fall apart. After collecting five magical items, we find Alessa's bedroom. We use these five items to unlock a door and get treated to another cutscene of Dahlia demanding Alessa give her some of her psychic power. We walk down the stairs and into the final cutscene. Now this will change depending on how much you've done, but because I've done everything, we're going to get the true ending, and this needs some explanation and some setup. I'm about to spoil the entire plot of Silent Hill 1, so mute the video if you're still going to play it. Several years ago, Dahlia led a cult. Her aim was to use her own daughter, Alessa, as a vessel to bring a demonic god into the world. So when Alessa was seven, she forced her to go through a god impregnation ritual. Kaufman was also part of this cult, and he he lured in new members by getting them addicted to a new drug and then controlling the drug's supply in return for them serving the cult. The nurse, Lisa, was one of these poor addicted cult members. The ritual was a failure. Alessa was left horribly disfigured by it and then used what little psychic power she had gained to split her soul in two, knowing this would delay the cult's ultimate goal of birthing a god. This splitting left Alessa on the verge of death, so they hid her in the hospital basement with nurse Lisa looking after her but only while she was drugged up. This is why Lisa remembers going into the basement and why she wished the child would die. It was out of sympathy. The other half of Alessa's soul was reborn as Cheryl, the young girl Harry Mason found on the road and then raised as his own. Several years later, Cheryl sees a advert on TV for Silent Hill and has a strong desire to visit the location, so Harry drives her there. When you lose your daughter Cheryl at the start, she's actually been taken by Dahlia. She has fused the split souls of Cheryl and Alessa back into a single demonic soul vessel, and the nightmare world you've been experiencing is part of a psychic projection of Alessa's fears. It's why she remembers the primary school, because the ritual happened when she was seven, and the hospital. It's also why the hospital basement is more detailed than the other floors, because she wasn't on those floors much. This is the world Alessa knows will come to be real if the god is birthed through her. Alessa has also been projecting herself around town, trying to create sigils designed to prevent the god's return. She's been trying to keep the town safe. And you've seen these sigils before in the school courtyard, on the TVs at the mall, on the floor of the roof of the lighthouse. These were the wards against the god's rebirth, and she was about to create the last sigil before you showed up and the Floros, the artifact Dahlia gave you, stopped her, allowing Dahlia to capture her in the nightmare world and bring her back to the ritual site. In the final cutscene, you can see Dahlia and the psychic projection of Alessa next to a rotting corpse in a wheelchair. That corpse is Alessa's actual physical body. Horribly mutilated, yet unable to die because it is a ritualistic vessel for God. Nurse Lisa went insane because she was forced to watch this young girl exist in agony forever and could do nothing to help her. With Alessa and Cheryl reunited, the soul is reforged and the God birthing begins. Now, if you've not done any of the extra objectives, you will fight the final boss Incubator, a glowing white child containing the God. Effectively meaning you have to kill Cheryl, your own adopted daughter, to stop 
the ritual. But if you did all of the extra stuff, Kaufman shows up and throws the bottle of red liquid he took from you earlier over the almost completed Alessa. This magical liquid is called Aglophotis. He has made it to be a failsafe in case the god they birthed rejected the cult's worship. The vial smashes over Alessa, killing her and forcing the incomplete god to take physical form, a winged demon type thing, whose first action is to set Dahlia on fire, which honestly is what she deserved. And now we face the the final boss, the god Dahlia wanted born while it's still mortal. The fight is honestly rubbish. First off, the camera is too low and you can't see the boss without manually looking up, but manually looking up means you can't keep shooting. And the boss only has one attack, a bolt of red lightning which hits you multiple times and will always kill you if you let it, so you need to wait for the first hit, then open your menu, use a healing item, which you'll have loads of by now, then tank the other hits while shooting. This is the only tactic which works. No puzzle, no smart strategy, no use of scenery, just spam healing items and unload everything you have into it until you win. Killing the gods saves Alessa. Now, your daughter Cheryl is gone because she was never a complete soul. She was just the other half of Alessa. But before Alessa disappears, Alessa reincarnates herself as a baby and hands that baby to Harry to raise as his own daughter because he saved her. During this, Lisa also claws her way out of hell just to drag Kaufman down with her. We can also assume that we never met the actual real Lisa. We only met Alessa's projection of her as she only ever existed in the nightmare world. And then we run away with Sybil to raise the reincarnated baby Alessa. And after that extremely emotional, deep, symbolic ending, what do you think we get? We get an after credit scene where they've animated the game's cutscenes as if they are actors messing up their lines or being silly. Like Toy Story. What a way to completely shift the tone of your game's ending. So Silent Hill 1, was it good? Well, according to the after game stats, it took me about 13 hours to finish, and I think most of those were spent looking at a map. It's a puzzle game, which starts grounded in reality and slowly descends into fragmented existence, which will heavily divide the player base. If you're after a more psychological journey through a child's psyche and a dollop of good old evil cult thrown in, you'll like it. If you're after a more standard horror game in a spooky town with evil monsters, you might be disappointed, because it goes off the rails toward the end and understanding the plot relies relies on you really, really paying attention to the minutia, like diaries or newspaper clippings. It's scary right up until you get the hammer, or enough buckshot to take down an army, and the in-depth exploration and map focus of the puzzles is a stark contrast to the underwhelming boss fights where back away and shoot is your only option. The fog became iconic, the music was great and the general ambience is top-notch. The town is wide open and contrasts nicely with the claustrophobic hospital hallways, but the star of the show are the camera angles and the general cinematography. It loses its horror grounding halfway through, but it never loses its artistic flair and visual style. The huge open town and the multiple buildings let you explore at your own pace. The hidden good ending subquest means it's got replay value, and the lack of jump scares keeps it tense all the way through. But the constant opening and closing of the map can really harm the pacing, and when you've got enough ammo to just shoot your way, you stop feeling scared. The puzzles were fantastic, complex but fair, rewarding to understand and solve. The moment of aha is super rewarding. The nightmare world is unforgettable and the use of relatable locations means everyone will be able to connect to them. Schools and hospitals will never feel the same. So to end the review, I will award Silent Hill 1. Let me just check my map. Oh, yep, there it is. Extremely creepy right up until you can hammer the nurses in the face out of 10. Cheers for watching. Another massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep the channel alive and allow me to do the long form reviews. You can support from only £1 a month. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter, and Discord. And as always, remember. Any idea what it means? Darkness devouring the town. Must be on drugs. <laughs>